Welcome to the Skillic Explains Finance video. This time, I want to take on the topic of pension transfers. Now, the background to this is you might want to have seen videos with a very similar title, Pension Basics 2019, focusing on the mechanics of defined benefit schemes, the mechanics of defined contribution schemes, and then one that sort of compares them side by side. I'm going to assume that you may have watched those, so let's get straight in to a thorny issue at the moment, pension transfers. Right, what's the background here? Well, Many employers, I've made this point before in other videos, are seeking to reduce their pension liabilities and exposures. So what that tends to translate as is they're trying to get out of their defined benefit scheme obligations or just not offer them in the first place. So employers that have got these schemes running are tending to look at the terms and try to tweak them in their favour, usually not the employee's favour, and other employers in the private sector are just saying, well, we're not going to offer them. And what's happening is, as employers who've offered these things in the past have got these you know, defined benefit schemes, they've got employees out there, current and former, with these defined benefit promises potentially, what's tending to happen is some of those employers are going back to those employees and saying, or former employees, would you like to change your mind essentially, move out of this defined benefit scheme into something else? In other words, have a check essentially and take it with you and basically give up your defined benefit benefits. Big decision. So let's look at some of the factors. So what is the DB challenge for employers? First of all, I've hinted at this. Uh, basically, DB schemes commit them to an uncertain future. In other words, they're making a promise that you'll get a percentage of your final average salary on retirement. They've got to fund that. Actuaries essentially tell them how much they've got to shovel in, and that contribution can vary all over the place. Um, so they need to invest now to cover a guaranteed outflow in the future. And the scheme may be overfunded or underfunded as a result, and it's obviously the underfunding which is causing the most headaches. If a scheme's overfunded, well, you might say happy days for the employer, take a contribution holiday or some such, but usually the problem is underfunding. Why? Well, here's what I call the deficit problem. Why are so many of these uh, final salary schemes, in many cases, running into deficits, causing the uh, employer, the, the scheme runner, problems? So. Basically, the principle is money can go in on one side from an employer and employees. An employee will be expected to contribute, but most of the variability sits with the employer. Um, the fund is then a pool of investments designed ultimately to fund those uh, final salary-based pensions or average salary-based pensions. So here's an example. Imagine that fund has got assets of 500 million. That's contributions in plus growth, if you like. Liabilities estimated by an actuary. Uh, these are clever people who can do this kind of stuff, project liability, work out the net present value value now, 800 million, bit of a problem. There's your deficit, 300 million, the difference between the two. So what are the solutions? Pretty simple, you either change the terms of the scheme to make it less generous, and some employers are looking at exactly that, like the state for example, is there a way we can sort of make this less generous? Controversial where you've already basically got employees with expectations in the scheme, or we're going to have to shovel some more money in. And that's the bit they don't like. They don't want these variable commitments on the left-hand side to fund schemes that can suddenly go from surplus to deficit, depending on factors such as investment performance, inflation, and how long people live. All right? Bear in mind, whatever decision they take, they've got to commit to meet that final defined benefit. Now, these transfer offers, so one of the things they might do is say, oh, is there a way we could persuade people in our defined benefit scheme, which we don't like, to move out? Well, they're having a go. So some employers will offer a lump sum, typically a multiple of the estimated first year income you could expect to receive when you finally draw on the scheme, which may not be till 60, 65. And when I say a multiple, it can be as high as 40 times. I've come across examples like that that first year's income. It may not be, it may be like 15, 20 times, but it looks like a pretty big sum. But I'll come back to why it needs to be in just a moment. Um, it's called a cash equivalent transfer value. The industry has a bit of jargon there. That, that, that's what it looks like. And uh, the decision to transfer is usually irreversible. So it's really important, and the FCA, the regulator, knows this. It's really important that people weigh this up properly and have all the facts at their fingertips before just thinking, wow, that's a big check. I'll just move out of my defined benefit schemes. If you change your mind, potentially there's nothing you can do about it. So why would you stay within the defined benefit scheme? Well, there are plenty of quite good reasons, and I'll sum up with some factors at the end. So you've got a guaranteed benefit. Basically, you have got that promise of an income stream 
linked to inflation potentially at the minimum retirement date. The investment risk is transferred from employer to employee and the PPF backstop is lost if you move out of that scheme. So basically, if you give up your defined benefit, benefits if you can see it that way, and take a cheque instead right now, a large looking sum, essentially you are saying, I'm happy to take the investment risk associated with that money, whereas it's borne by the scheme provider if you don't. And the PPF backstop, I've mentioned in other videos, that's just a bit of protection, an important piece of protection should a scheme provider go bust. That also goes out of the door if you make the move. And you may run out of money, simple as that. What looks like a great big lump sum check today from an employer to make the move can dwindle rapidly if you don't get your sums right. So reasons to consider transferring, on the other hand, so okay, I'm gonna take this check, why would I do that and give up all of those privileges and promises, if you like. Well, there is flexibility about income withdrawal, both in terms of when it happens, okay, and also the timing of it, the way it happens. So with the defined benefit scheme, you might be stuck in there till 60, 65, until you can actually start pulling benefits out, and then they're, they're defined for you, hence the name, defined benefit. Whereas if you make a transfer, defined contribution schemes give you a lot more flexibility about both the age and timing of withdrawals. There's control over the investment process. Now, some people won't like that, but with a defined contribution scheme, once you've got the money, if you like, you then control the investment strategy rather than your employer with their pension scheme provider. And there may be some inheritance tax benefits. So if you're someone who's in, in the fortunate position to be able to make inheritance tax planning decisions, there are a few benefits to defined contribution as opposed to defined benefit. But it's got to be weighed up quite carefully. So factors to weigh up. And by the way, this is very personal. This is not a uh, personal advice video, but these are personal to you. They'll vary from person to person. Age and health. So when is the scheme provider, the employer, making this offer to write you a check? Are you still very, very young? Could you enjoy future investment growth? Or are you quite old? In, in other words, you know, what sort of runway are you looking at in terms of how long the money's got to last if you were to accept the offer? And health. Another factor, because you might take a view that if you're not in terribly good health, uh, basically a lot of the final salary promise might sort of die with you, and therefore maybe there's a case for weighing up what could be a fairly sizable check uh, that could potentially be inheritance tax efficient for your heirs and so on. Other income sources, that's important. Do you have properties that generate income? Do you have a big portfolio elsewhere that generates income? In other words, are you reliant on this pension money as your main source of post-work income or not, and that will vary from person to person. And that will be a factor in this decision to switch or not. As for your risk tolerance, if you're the kind of person that won't sleep at night if you don't know that you've got a fixed income index linked kicking in at a certain age, then these transfers are definitely not for you. But if you have more of a risk tolerance combined with some of these other factors I've mentioned, maybe it's worth considering. The desire for flexibility, is that important to you? Do you want control over the investment process with your money, which you do get a degree of with defined contribution, for example, if you make the switch from DB to DC, um, is the retirement age, minimum age, that flexibility important to you? And is the ability to schedule how you draw down income from a fund important or not? And is that something you can envisage wanting control over and being able to keep control over? And finally, dependents and IHT. How many dependents do you have? Are you planning to make provision for them? Are there any benefits to you in having the sort of DC approach? So a couple more slides to go and then we'll wrap up. The process would be, if you were thinking about this, this transfer from one to another, there'd be an initial meeting normally, gather scheme details, complete the detailed analysis, recommend the best, the best option, by the way, not automatically you should transfer, definitely not, but what is the best option for you? And then a final meeting. So the point here is that even if you decide you might go down this route of transferring from DB to DC, there's quite a lot of work to be done in the meantime, quite a few decisions to be made along the way. And that's probably correct, because it's a really big decision. So conclusions overall, the FCA make advice mandatory. So for anyone out there thinking, oh, I might take the check to move away from a final salary scheme, the FCA thank goodness in a way, make it compulsory where the transfer value is above £30,000. And frankly, it may be a good idea even if the transfer value is not £30,000 because it's a big decision here. Advice should be a mixture of hard analysis, 
critical yield, for example, and a careful review of your personal factors. So anyone talking to you about this should weigh up very carefully those factors I mentioned earlier on, alongside doing some hard numbers, working out the financial implications of accepting what looks like a generous lump sum, but actually when you try and replicate the income that you might be looking to get in a defined benefit scheme, the growth rate needed to achieve that may look too punchy. And that's all part of the analysis. If in doubt, the FCA's default position is don't do it. In other words, if you've got any doubts, if it's not going to be suitable for you, the FCA quite correctly say, stick with that defined benefit rather than undertake a route that leaves you with an unspecified unknown benefit. To find out more, editor at killick.com. If you'd like to watch some of the videos I mentioned at the start, then killick.com forward slash learn. Run down here, there's a tax effective savings tab.